Construction workers in the real world build buildings. They construct things. Now, constructors in programming are your construction workers in the virtual world, in the virtual sense. And what these virtual constructors do is build objects. What's really nice about this is the fact that it can save you a ton of time. And I will explain this in just a second. But also, it allows you to properly attach a prototype object. This is nice because you are not manipulating a prototype object that you shouldn't be manipulating using the dot underscore underscore proto underscore underscore. Also, that only applies to Chrome. If you try doing that in other browsers, you may get an error. So browser vendors made this very, very difficult to access the prototype object because they don't want you doing it that way. They want you to do it the proper way. And the proper way is to go through the syntax of JavaScript. And I will show you how to do this. But what's so important about constructor functions is it saves you time. Previously, in the last lecture, I created three Apple objects. And for each line, I had to write out the object. OK, I didn't have to do that. I just pressed the up arrow. But however, if I was typing this out in a regular JavaScript file, I'd have to copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste. And potentially, I could get syntax errors. I might miss off an ending semicolon. Also, I might misspell one of the property names and so on and so forth. So it creates a huge issue. And we want that consistency between our objects. Objects. And this has a huge importance. And as you go through your programming career, you will see constructors are incredibly important in advanced applications, especially when it comes to games and so forth. In games, you can have hundreds of enemies and all the enemies look quite similar to one another. And you want to create an object that resembles each enemy. That way your program can target that enemy. And if your player comes in contact with that enemy, it can go ahead and start running methods, maybe from the prototype object. So all the enemies have the same methods associated with them. And also they may have the same properties. They look the same. They're sort of a similar type of enemy. So you could have hundreds of enemies. What are you going to do? You're going to write those objects out all by yourself. Or are you going to dynamically create all of those objects? It sounds a lot easier to me to dynamically create all of those objects. And then you can modify some of their properties at a later date and also have that shared object in there associated with all of your enemies. So you've got that consistency in your application. It helps cut down errors. And also, let's take this one step further. Let's say your player, as he moves along on the map, let's say that you want to dynamically generate enemies and bring them straight into the gameplay and dynamically place enemies here, there and everywhere. Well, again, where's that object going to come from that resembles that enemy? What's going to happen there? Well, you're going to need to have a template. You're going to need to have a blueprint. And then that blueprint needs to be turned into an object. And that blueprint is stored in a constructor function. And in JavaScript, you use functions to define your blueprint. Now, in order for me to show you how to code a constructor function, and there's going to be quite a lot of lines of code there, I think it's best we use a JavaScript file in this particular instance. The reason being is because trying to type this all out in the console window could be quite burdensome and it isn't really nice to read. I like reading nice formatted syntax. So what I'm going to do is first of all create a JS directory containing an index.html file which I won't elaborate on too much and then also we have our javascript.js file. This javascript file will be interpreted and compiled by the JavaScript JIT compiler or the JavaScript engine within the browser. Now I want to edit these files with a text editor. You can use any text editor, even Notepad, let's say on Windows. However, it's preferred that you have a text editor with syntax highlighting. This is better for you to read and understand the syntax. Now what I'm going to do is modify these files within a free text editor called brackets by Adobe. This text editor is very nice. You can use whatever text editor you would like. But if you'd like to use brackets, then please go to brackets.io and download this text editor for free. Now, in order for me to edit these files, what I'll do is open up brackets and then I'll simply shrink this in, grab the JS directory, click and drag and drop it. That's the easiest way. And then I can open up the index.html file and the script.js file as well. 
Now you should already understand and have working knowledge of HTML. If not, I recommend you stop and watch a course on HTML. But you may not know how HTML is compiled. And this is important because if you don't understand how it's compiled, you may not put your JavaScript in the best place. The way HTML is compiled is it block loads, node by node. So here we have the HTML node, then we have the head node and so on and so forth. And you can think of these as blocks or bricks. When you build a house, you start with one brick, then you add another brick, another brick, another brick, and eventually you end up with a house. So you go brick by brick or block loading. This is exactly how HTML works. It goes line by line. Now, when it comes to your JavaScript files, what happens is it stops. Whenever it sees those script tags, it stops. And it either interprets the JavaScript that is in between the script tags, which you can have JavaScript in between the script tags, and that's called inline JavaScript, but also you can include external scripts. And whenever it sees this script tag, it stops dead in its tracks and it interprets the JavaScript. And in this case, what it does is it downloads the JavaScript file and it interprets the JavaScript. Once it's finished downloading the file and interpreting the JavaScript, it carries on again, line by line. Now this can be a bit of an issue when you have large JavaScript files, and I see a lot of web pages do this, have it in their head tags. What this does is slows down the rendering of your page. Because if you have, let's say, quite a lot of elements here that need to be rendered, you've got some CSS, which I definitely recommend you include your CSS in between the two head tags. What happens is once it gets to the script tag, it's going to stop. So nothing in the body at the moment is going to be rendered until this JavaScript file is downloaded and interpreted. Once it's been downloaded and interpreted, then it carries on rendering. So that's why I recommend putting your script tags right at the bottom of the body tags, just before the ending or closing body tag. And this is quite important because it will help your page to render quicker and it will make your page feel quicker, even though it's actually not. It's still including the same amount of JavaScript files, but it will render quicker and that gives a better result to the user. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the script.js file that I'm including and will be interpreted by the browser. So what is this script all about? Well, what we want to achieve is three Apple objects. And each one of those Apple objects has a color, width, and height property. Once we have all of these properties, we also want to establish a link to a prototype object. So we're gonna to link to another object that has the eat, throw, and nibble methods. So this is what we're trying to achieve here. So first of all, we have the function. This is our construction worker. It's the bloke where you call him up and you say, right, build me an extension. But what we're doing is we're calling up this bloke and saying, build me an object. And his name is construct apple. Now, just as a quick note and a recommendation, start your constructor function names with a capital letter. So this function is called construct apple and the very first letter is a capital. That's recommended. You can give it whatever name you'd like, such as Apple Make or anything like that, but please start it with a capital letter. That's just a recommendation, it's not a requirement. Now we have set up this function and we know what a function is, we have a few lines in here. Now ignore console.log this because we'll come back to it at a later date. We'll come back to what console log does and all the rest of it. However, all this function is doing is it's returning an object. It's giving back an object when it's called. And this object will have a color property with a value of red, a width property with a value of 200, and a height property of the value of 300. So we have this object, but we also need to establish a special relationship to a shared object because I don't want to define the eat, throw and nibble methods for every single object, because that means that our application becomes less manageable and also the eat, throw and nibble methods or functions are repeated over and over and over again for each Apple object that is created. And that takes up more memory and it makes our application less manageable. So we need a prototype object. So every Apple object that is created by construct Apple 
is going to link to the prototype object that's associated with this function. We will look more into this, don't get confused, but just understand this function creates an object with those three properties. And not only that, it establishes a relationship with the prototype object that is attached to our function. So we've not invoked our function here. We've not put the opening and closing brackets. This says run the function, but we don't want to run the function. We want to attach a prototype object. And this prototype object is going to be linked to by all of the Apple objects that is generated by this function. And the prototype object simply has eat, throw, and nibble. So for every apple we create, we can call the eat method, the throw method, and the nibble method. Now you'll notice we are calling the construct apple function three times. If we were to, let's say, call back this function right here, whatever is returned from this function will be returned here. We know that it's returning an object. So I run this function right here and it returns the object right here like that with the color, width and height property and so on and so forth. But the problem is you've created an anonymous object. We can't reference that object. It needs to be in a box. So that returned object needs to be stored in a box. So you need to create the box, give the box a name so you can refer to it later. And then when this has been invoked, when this function has been invoked, what happens is it will run, it will create that object with the special relationship to the prototype object and return that right there. So now when I call Apple, it will then let me look at that box, look at what's inside of it, and it will be that object that was created by the construct Apple function. So you can call a function when you are assigning values to a variable or box. When you want to put something in a box, you can call a function if you wish. And the value that is returned from that function, whether it be a string or an object or a number or whatever it is that your function returns, that value that is returned can be stored within a variable. Now, what I want to do is not really concentrate on this whole constructing an object, the new keyword, the this keyword, and so on and so forth. That's for the next lecture. What I want to do is very quickly go over the console log method. So what does the log method do? And what are we referring to when it comes to targeting the console? You know that we've been working with the console window. So what are we targeting here? Well, we're targeting that exact same console window. Now, prior to this particular project, we were directly inputting commands to the console window. But how do you input commands to the console window when it comes to your JavaScript files? Well, what we do is we use the console.log method. Now, whenever you log something, you're getting the output. So whatever is in between these brackets, those commands, those statements will be run, and then the output of those commands will be given. So let's go ahead and get rid of the this keyword in here. We'll come back to that in the next lecture. Let's go ahead and log out a string and say function run. So this function construct apple has been run three times, one, two, and three. Now, what's gonna happen here is the function is gonna be invoked and it's gonna target the console window and it's gonna log out, it's gonna output the string function run. So whenever you say log, think of output. There's the command and then we're simply outputting it. So you're just gonna get the string function run. So if I go ahead and save that and I click on this lightning icon, this will open up the web browser and it will launch your project. And then I can simply right click and say inspect element. And I'm looking at the console window and the console window shows me function run. So I can see the function run string came from the console.log method and that's the command that I inputted. So if I copy this and then I go ahead and paste it, you'll notice again, that's exactly what we got. We inputted the string and we got the output function run. So you can see function run, function run, function run, dead easy. 
You can also, again, type in mathematical equations. So I can say 100 plus 100, something like that. That should give me 200. And don't forget, I'm calling the function three times. So I'll get this value repeated three times. So if I go ahead and refresh the browser, you'll notice I get 200, 200, 200. So this is really, really nice. It's just like you typing in here. So whenever you go console.log, think of this line right here and say 100 plus 100, just like that. And that's exactly what it gave you. So you provided the input via the log method. So that's the input command. And all it gave you was the output. That's all log does is give you the output and the output was 200. So it gave you 200 three times. Now on top of this, console.log is very good also for finding out what is inside of variables. So for example, I can say var test equals, and then let's say 100 plus 100. So now I've got this equation inside of, and in fact, let's just change that a bit, 100 plus 150, and then I can call the variable test. Simple as that. So I can go ahead and save it now, hit refresh, and you'll notice I get 250 repeated three times because the function was invoked, it was called three times. And you don't just have to simply log out like this, which is one value at a time or one command at a time. What you could do is I could create a second variable. So I can say this variable is obj and it's going to equal an object. And I'll just say prop. And then we're going to give it the value of property. Very, very simple object. But now if I want to log it out, I simply put in a comma between the variable names primitive data or anything else, any other command that you want to log out. So I can say obj, log that out. I can say log a string out. You can just keep going. And I can even say, um, well, let's get test plus 50. So we're going to grab the value contained within test, which is 250 plus 50 will give us 300. So we have quite a few things that we're logging out here. If I refresh the browser, you can see that it logged out the value stored within test, which is 100 plus 150, that's 250. The next thing I asked the console to log out was the obj variable, this variable right here, which contains an object, which contains one key and value pair, which the key name is prop and the value property. And there we go. And also it tells you the type as well. So we can see the type of content that is contained within there is an object and also we can take a look at the primitive data again i just typed in a string and then finally i said test plus 50 which equals 300 so it logged out all of that information to the console in one line this is fantastic for debugging and taking a look at what's happening under the hood of our scripts